Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Warwick. I'm a, a landscape architect. Um, and I also spend a, a lot of my time um, on projects where I'm trying to um, insert green space into pretty hostile, um, con constrained and uh, artificial environments. Um, so my focus at Aspect Studios is largely on green infrastructure and living architecture. Um, the front, this slide here is, a, is an example, I suppose, of where we're, we've taken uh, what was a piece of grey infrastructure and repurposed it and retrofitted it um, to provide some green infrastructure, which is um, about 13 kilometres of uh, green open space and um, around 3,000 semi-advanced trees planted as part of this project. So it's really been a transformation um, of that part of the community. There's generally, I guess, a perception that Melbourne's a, a fairly green um, city that's well endowed with a lot of open space and green assets, and that is largely the case. There are some fantastic um, green spaces and the urban forests in the city of Melbourne um, is, is a really a, a, a largely a thriving um, uh, forest. But if looking at it from other perspectives, there's huge press, pressures on our city with, with the um, urbanisation and increasing density and loss of green space. And the verticality of our city is, is getting to the point where we're really uh, pushing the limits of livability. So, I guess uh, our focus, one of my focus is, is seeing, trying to engineer nature back into this urbanised artificial environment and focusing on um, including uh, sufficient soil volumes and, and getting plants and water to work together to try and recreate some of the, the uh, natural processes that we really need to um, enable us to to, to be a, have a sustainable um, urban environment. And really trying to marry, um, I guess, uh, technology, engineering, um, and horticulture with natural processes of nature. So I, uh, we, we see this, the city as an interrelated network of elements. Um, there's connections of systems, of water systems, movement systems, pipe work, services, obviously the built environment. And, and, and we're working to incorporate this into and see it as a, as a whole and, and taking opportunities where they are to, um, to link all of those systems together. And really the title of this talk was The City is a Living Machine. And, and I suppose it's the, the function of green infrastructure is that it, it's harnessing natural process and, and getting the the benefits from nature that really do come free in terms of improvement to water quality and reduction in temperatures um, and also just the proximity and closeness to nature that we all need to feel connected um, to our lives. Part of it is identifying and being quite conscious about the benefits that they provide. Uh, a lot of things in our world get measured and if they don't get measured, they don't have a value. And it's, it's very hard sometimes to, to measure and quantify some more of the um, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, non-quantitative and more qualitative benefits. But they're real benefits. And if we don't acknowledge them, um, they won't be factored into decision making. So we, we try and be quite explicit about communicating what those benefits are, whether it's about water, about human well-being, food, and being quite aware that um, and conscious about the design decisions we make around them. When I talk about living architecture, it's about the incorporation of plants and vegetations directly onto buildings. And there's a few formats that you can look at in order to achieve that. Um, green roofs, rooftop gardens, um, with, with actual horizontal gardens used, uh, installed on rooftops and podiums. Um, green walls, which are completely planted vertical surfaces, um, and green facades, which utilise climbing plants up trellises or this combination of cables or wires. So these are the, the elements that we can work with and hybridise to get 
um, architectural outcomes. A green roof is also can, can be an occupiable space and provide really good amenity, um, bring people together, grow food, um, look out onto, um, and they, they also can work with that green infrastructure principle of um, <clears throat> regulating temperature of the building and, and capturing, storing and, and minimising runoff. Green walls um, is a, a bit of, uh, I guess, conjecture about the sustainability of these. They, they can be um, uh, quite thirsty, but with some improvements in some of the green wall technology with, with better sort of water holding capacity of the panels, um, they can start to become quite sustainable, valuable vertical landscapes. Green facades are important um, as lightweight um, solutions and l lower cost getting a bit more bang for buck in terms of greening per um, dollar cost per square metre. And they also, if, when, when designed well into the facade, can provide really good um, building thermal comfort regulation, reduce temperatures um, with um, sun and heat on the building facades, and also give really good visual um, amenity from people within the building, but also you'll see in some of these other slides the vision of this greened vertical city um, whereby we're getting a community benefit for seeing the, um, these vertical gardens across groups of buildings. And as we work with these systems, we get more confident and familiar with um, how to achieve the results we want to get. There's a, uh, an image of how the green facade can work on the building thermal performance and, and also other uh, sort of sustainability initiatives. Podium landscapes as well um, are effectively green roofs with a, with a, with a big deeper build-up and a bit more load on them, but they, they are engineered artificial environments. Um, you can install significant sized vegetation. You do need to be aware of... Um, the load constraints on balconies. I guess this isn't new. We've been humans have been thinking about this for a long time, and some of the um, panels of part of this um, exhibit show that sort of evolution of thinking of greening the city. The certain certainly people have continued to have pretty kind of um, sci-fi visions of what the future city is going to be using these sorts of technologies, but we are seeing it. Um, built in cities around the world and architects, engineers and landscape architects are, are tackling this at a big scale. Um, this project in Milan, um, a fantastic example, Bosco Vertical, um, big balcony planters creating a, a really verdant tower. Um, a project in Sydney, uh, One Central Park, is, is, is a bit of a flagship for um, vertical greening and, and was a project where we could really sort out the, um, the technical implications of this and it's, it's, it's quite, been quite successful. It's quite a heavy um, labour maintenance intensive and water intensive project and so it's, there's, there's some it's set a pretty high bar but and, and maybe we won't achieve that level of greening again. There's a big cost impost on the, on the owners of these units in terms of their body corporate fees. A couple of projects we've worked on in Melbourne um, not six, haven't really got across the line for various reasons, but starting to um, encapsulate some of these ideas. And um, uh, the, these are all achievable. There's, there's factors that are limiting their success, but it's not from one of trying or from, from lack of technical understanding. There's, there's lots of planning um, implications. Um, the designer of Bosco Vertical in Milan's got another project in Utrecht, um, which is a similar vertical forest. We do have some large-scale vertical um, gardens in Melbourne. This is a car park on City Road, nine storeys of green facade. Um, there's lots of green walls around Melbourne. Melbourne City Council are really embracing that. Um, some of the technologies I've, uh, I've shown before Green roofs that on a big scale, the desal plant's got a 2.6 2 hectare um, extensive green roof, which is a very shallow, uh, 
profile. This is uh, local indigenous vegetation. I guess the, the idea of, of um, indigenous and native and, and eco ecosystems and whether we can really be purist about the fact that we're changing this planet to such a degree, um, we, we have to confront those ideas about what is native and indigenous. I'll wrap it up now, but a lot of this is, um, can be worked into the planning regulations and, and approval process. City of Melbourne's got a big um, agenda for greening our city and have a number of um, planning policy and um, regulations that are coming up. We're looking at green infrastructure plot ratios um, and having rating tools to assess developments. There's funding, um, there's, a, there's an urban forest strategy, but also funding um, to encourage more greening, other funding. Um, a lot of it is about economics. Um, we often struggle to, to, to sort of get the value proposition right in terms of who pays for the cost of this. There are different ways of looking at that, and I think that's where I get back to the, um, by combining the benefits, not always financial and monetary, but other, some of the other qualitative benefits. If you can include that in your, your cost value proposition, you can get it across the line, but maintenance is always a, a difficult one and not often factored into the project costs. Um, overseas, they're doing it. Singapore, you drop a seed on the pavement and it grows. We have a different challenge here um, in order to sort of realise some of these visions. Wrap it up there and hand over to Sky.